Hey everyone, welcome to another T's lesson. Today we're going to look at part two of the basic atomic structure. And today we're going to look at the periodic table um, about how to explain and predict the properties of elements. Now for this lesson, um, the periodic table kind of organizes uh, the different elements based on their atomic numbers, right? So they're arranged in, so the elements are arranged in order from atomic number one, which is a hydrogen, and that number increases. Now, the pure F table has this way of organizing elements with a similar chemical properties in the same column. So these are the columns, and normally elements in the same columns have a similar chemical properties. And the reason is that elements in the same column have the same number of electrons in the valence shell. We talked about this in the previous video for T6. The number of electrons in the outermost shell, which is the valence shell, determines the chemical properties of an element. So if you look at um, some of the columns, some of you are pro probably already familiar with this, but for those who are not very familiar yet, if you look at the elements in the same column, so for example, the first column, all these elements are gonna have one electron in the valence shell. And then the next column, they're gonna have two electrons in the valence shell. And on the other side, the numbers increases, right? So for oxygen, and in sulfur, they're going to have six electrons in the valence shell. And then the next column, fluorine, chlorine, they're going to have seven electrons in the valence shell. The elements in the last column has eight electrons in the valence shell, which is a stable number, right? We talk about the octet rule in the previous video in T for T6. So once you have eight electrons in the valence shell, it's a stable configuration. So these elements, they're called noble gas elements, and they are very stable. They do not like to react with other atoms. So they're considered not very reactive, very stable chemically. So I kind of jumped ahead a little bit, and this is more information on the valence shell, on the octet rule. Now, the key is to be able to figure out the electron configuration for an element that you're not familiar with, right? If you are just given the number of atomic number, how are you going to figure out how many electrons there are in the valence shell? And with that information, how would the atom react, right? Is it reactive or not reactive? How is it gonna deal with the electrons, right? Is the atom gonna lose or gain electrons? Because all that determines how the atom is gonna react chemically. So if you are given a certain number of electrons, okay, what you wanna do is for the innermost shell, you want to assign two electrons and that will provide a stable configuration. Okay, so let's say I give you, um, say, 13 electrons. Okay? So the first shell can hold up to two electrons. So you definitely have more than two electrons, right? So you're going to put down two for the first electrons. And now you are down to 11 electrons, right? So you just keep filling the rest of the, the shells. Now, the second shell follows the normal octet rule, right? Octet that refers to eight. So it, it can hold up to eight electrons. So if you have more than eight, then you can only put eight in there because eight is the maximum. If you have less than eight electrons, then you can just put whatever is left um, in that shell. So in this case, 11, you have more than 8, right? So this shell can hold up to 8. Okay? Um, so that brings you down to 3 electrons. So the next shell can also hold up to 8 electrons. But you only have a 3 left, right? So you don't have, you don't have 8, so you're just going to put whatever left in, uh, in there. So you're going to have 3 electrons. So this is going to be the electron configuration for this particular element. 
So for the first shell, you have two. The next shell, you have eight. And then for the next shell, you have a three. So valence shell is going to have three electrons. And you can look at the example on the slide, which is a potassium. So that will give you another practice on assigning the, the electrons to the different shells. All right, now you know how to determine the number of electrons in the valence shell, right? Basically, just assign different numbers of electrons to different shells. So once you have this information, then you can decide how this atom is going to behave. If there are five, six, or seven electrons in the valence shell, then this atom is going to likely gain electrons, right? Because you want to get to that eight electron configuration because this is the stable state, right? So you want to get to that eight. Atoms have that tendency to become chemically stable. So they want to get to that eight electrons in the valence shell. So if there are already five, six, or seven, it's just easier to gain one, two, or three electrons, right? To get to eight. So these atoms will gain electrons, and then you already know, we talked about this last time, they will become negative ions, right? Which are A ions. Now, if there are only one, two, or three electrons in the valence shell, then instead of gaining seven, six, or five, which are big numbers, right? That probably involves a lot of work, okay? So instead of doing that, it's probably easier to just lose one, two, or three electrons. So you will get down to the previous shell, which should have two or eight electrons, right? That stable state. So once you lose this, these electrons, you will get positive ions, right, which are known as cat ions. So with the number of uh, valence electrons, you can kind of predict how the atoms will behave, right? Are they going to become negative ions or positive ions, or maybe they will share electrons? So this is another way for atoms to become chemically stable, right? So instead of completely losing or gaining electrons, they can share electrons with another atom to get to that eight electrons, the stable state. So that's another way to become stable. And when atoms share electrons, that's a covalent bond. Now, if atoms completely gain or lose electrons, that's an ionic bond. Okay. Again, if you want to know more about the different types of chemical bonds, then go to the video for T6. I um, talk about in detail the three types of chemical bonds, ionic bond, covalent bond, and hydrogen bond. Okay, now there is a tip for uh, kind of determining when you will get an ionic bond, when you get a covalent bond. Usually, if a chemical bond involves metals, that's usually an ionic bond. Okay? If there are no metals, all the elements are non-metal elements, then you might see a covalent bond. Okay, so that's the that's one tip that you can use to decide whether you have an ionic bond or a covalent bond. And I have seen questions on T's about the different types of chemical bonds. So that's something that you definitely want to make sure you know um, and be able to apply on the test. So let's look at uh, some practice questions. Okay, the first one. Okay, this question is about potassium, right? I did that on purpose because I have a slide on the electron configuration for potassium. So if you're not sure about this question, you can go back to that slide and then figure out uh, how many electrons are in the valence shell. And the correct answer is just one electron in the valence shell. So this means potassium will lose 
one electron, right, to get down to the previous shell, which has eight electrons. So it's easier for potassium to lose that electron, that one electron, to follow that octet rule, right, to have a full valence shell. The correct answer is A. And then this full valence shell is referred to the previous shell. Because once you lose this electron, then the next shell will become the valence shell. And it has eight electrons. So potassium ion with one positive charge, that's a stable state for potassium. OK, next question. Now, for this question about nitrogen, we know that nitrogen has seven protons and 10 electrons. So can we use that information to determine whether nitrogen is going to be a positive or negative ion? And what is the atomic mass? Okay. Now, we can actually eliminate C and D pretty quickly, right? Because you see the number 17 here. So the um, likely explanation is that someone adds up seven protons and 10 electrons to get to the atomic mass. But remember, electrons have negligible weight, right? So we do not consider electrons when we calculate the atomic mass. The atomic mass should be the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. We know the number of protons, seven, but we do not know the number of neutrons. It could be 10, it could be a different number, right? But we definitely cannot use the number of electrons to calculate the, the atomic mass. C and D are just kind of here to trick you, right? They did a seven plus 10, which is 17. But again, that 10 is the number of electrons and electrons uh, are not part of the atomic mass. So C and D are not correct. So there are seven protons, so that means nitrogen should have seven electrons, right? Because protons and electrons, they should have the same number. But it says here, there are 10 electrons, right? So that's a three more than what it should be. So that means this nitrogen atom has gained three electrons, right? So once it gains three electrons, it becomes a nitrogen ion. And it's going to carry negative three charge, right? Because it gains the electrons, which have negative charge. So the correct answer is B. OK, next question. Which of the following elements has a similar chemical properties as bromine? Find the bromine on the periodic table is right here. So if you recall, the elements in the same column have similar chemical properties, right? So now you just need to look for uh, whichever option is in this column. And the correct answer is C, fluorine. All right, next question. Which of the following compounds are ionic compounds? And if you recall, um, I mentioned that typically, if you have metals forming that chemical bond, then it's likely to be an ionic bond. Right? And then the compounds are going to be ionic compounds. And I um, found this periodic table with different elements labeled according to their categories. Right? So you can see all the blue elements are metal elements. 
So um, with this information, you just need to look for whichever options have metal elements, and that's going to be an ionic compound. So let's see. Calcium is a metal, right? Uh, sodium is a metal, and magnesium is a metal. So the correct answer is B, C, and E. And then the rest of the um, compounds are going to be covalent compounds. They form a covalent bond. Now, one thing I want to mention is that um, if you have a copy of the slide, originally I wasn't going to uh, include option E. I, I don't know what happened, but um, apparently I added option E to the question. So E is a correct answer. And then on the last slide, the key, I'm going to jump in here. Uh, since I added magnesium oxide, E is also going to be a correct answer. Okay, So you have three correct answers, B, D, and E. All right, the next question is kind of just a practice for you to get used to finding the atomic number and then the number of the different subatomic particles and atomic weight. So I have listed some of the common elements um, in the table. So you can take your time and fill in the table with the, a, a periodic table. That would be very helpful. I mean, the more you practice, the more familiar you will become with all this information. And I have some additional elements if you want to practice uh, a little bit more. So yeah, I'll just let you do this on your own time. And since the information is out there, I don't have the key because uh, that'll be too much information. All right, and um, so this concludes the basic atomic structure lesson. And it would be great if you could subscribe, like the video, leave me a comment, and share the video. All right, thank you. See you next time.